All right, all right. Well, it's uh, really good to be here. Uh, thanks. And um, yeah, so actually, this is um, the quote that I opened the book with, and I think it's appropriate that I open the, um, the presentation with it too. Uh, this is from Werner von Braun, uh, the architect of Apollo's, uh, or I'm sorry, NASA's Apollo program. Uh, here on Earth, we live on a planet that is in orbit around the sun. The sun itself is a star, which is on fire and will someday burn up, leaving our solar system uninhabitable. Uh, therefore, we must build a bridge to the stars, because as far as we know, we are the only sentient creatures in the entire universe. When do we start building that bridge to the stars? We begin as soon as we are able. And this is that time. We must not fail in this obligation we have to keep alive the only meaningful life we know of. And I chose that uh, to open up the book and to open up uh, this conversation, this presentation, just because I think it encapsulates uh, what the book is really about and uh, what I think space exploration should really be about, at least what uh, maybe it was about what Von Braun thought it was about back when he was building the Apollo rockets. Um, some people seem to think that this is, uh, my book is really about the question of life elsewhere in the universe, uh, but that's not exactly true. Um, it's really much more about, um, well, it is about exoplanets, and it's about the search for other Earths, other Earth-like exoplanets, but it's much more about our own Earth and our lives right here, uh, which we, you know, we too often forget our own planet is an exoplanet to every star in the sky except for one. So uh, you, know, you can look around and you think about what an alien biosphere is like, what, uh, you know, what it's like to be an alien on an exoplanet. You know, look, look around you, look in the mirror, look at things in nature outside. It's, it's a perspective that's valuable if it's a little prosaic. Um, so it's really not so much about life out there, the book, as it is about you know, life right here, right now, and what life really does once it gets started on an Earth-like planet. You know, what, what are we going to do with our moment in the sun? Where are we going to take it? Um, so that's kind of where I start out, and that's really what the book tries to explore. And uh, this is the cover, obviously. I know it's already been plastered up everywhere. Uh, the title, I have to say, uh, is not, in, with apologies to Gabriel Garcia Marquez, it's not inspired by 100 years of solitude. A lot of people seem to think it is. It's not. Uh, it's actually inspired by the lifespan of the biosphere, as far as we know. The Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. We know that from dating meteorites and really old rocks. Uh, and we can look and see within those rocks, at least the, the earliest ones we really have that are well preserved, uh, that life got started here pretty quick after the Earth cooled from the great impacts that formed it. So life is really, our planet's been alive almost as long as it's been around. So you, you know you get a 4.5 billion years. Uh, the lifespan of the biosphere, obviously, you start with that 4.5 billion years, and then you project into the future. Well, you know, back in the day, astronomers used to say the end of the world, the end of the biosphere, would come about 5 billion years from now, when the sun becomes a red giant. The sun, obviously, you know, is a star, and it changes as it evolves, it becomes this big red giant, goes out to about you know two astronomical units, engulfs the inner planets, and that's the end of life on Earth, right? Well, a little later on, you know, planetary scientists said, OK, well, sure, you know, that's going to happen in the Earth's crust where we melted down to slag. But before that, about 2 billion years before that, or you know, about 2 billion years from now, uh, we're going to lose our oceans because the sun is steadily getting brighter over time. So the surface temperature increases, water boils, turns into steam, escapes into space, we lose our oceans. So people are saying, well, that's the end. And actually, today, it seems like the end is about, if you're a little pessimistic, about 500 million years from now. That's when the end begins. And that's because, again, the sun gets hotter. And as the sun's getting hotter, the surface temperature is rising. And while that's happening, the Earth's interior is getting cooler. And volcanism is diminishing and declining. We're going to reach a point, essentially, where the uh, this is going to throw the carbon cycle out of whack. And uh, a lot of the details are in the book. I'm kind of glossing over this part to get some, uh, to some other juicy stuff. But essentially, uh, we may only have about 500 million years before this happens. The carbon cycle goes all out of whack. Uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is pulled out of the air into the rocks. There's no longer any CO2 for plants to use to drive photosynthesis. So photosynthesis ends, plants die. They're the base of the food chain. We die. So that's kind of when that's going to start happening. Bacteria can exist a lot longer, but we're not talking about bacteria. We're interested in things like us. We're interested in complex life. So that's where the five billion years comes in. The solitude part kind of comes in from really just what we're seeing around us and what we're seeing on our own planet. The fact that out of the four and a half billion year history of our planet, we see no, ev no evidence of anything else like us. You know, nothing that could build rockets or radio telescopes or nuclear bombs or write sonnets or plays or you know, feel love. There's, there's not a lot of evidence of that. I mean, even if you include our hominid ancestors, that's about you know, 200,000 years, maybe a million years you're looking at. It's, it's not a lot. So we're just a blip. 
And uh, we do seem to be kind of special in the fullness of the, planet, of the planet's life. Uh, similarly, you know, you look out into space, you see all these stars. We now know there's lots of planets around those stars. We don't really see, we aren't looking very hard yet, uh, but we don't really see anything else like us out there. We don't see any evidence of any technological civilizations. We don't see Captain Kirk in the Enterprise or Luke Skywalker in the Death Star. We don't see any of that. It's deathly quiet. So, uh, I, you know, th this is, this is a, there's a lot of people who've talked about this much more eloquently than I'm going to, uh, at least on stage. Maybe the book's a different matter. But um, that, that kind of speaks to me and makes me wonder whether or not, you know, we are um, in all practical purposes alone. And if we really have what it takes to kind of break our solitude, uh, because right now, you know, we, we really are on the cusp of doing things like finding Earth-like planets around the nearest thousand stars, finding out whether or not we're alone. We're on the cusp of doing that. We know how to do it. We have the money. We have the capability. But it doesn't seem like we have the will. And I'm not really sure if we're going to get it. And so that's a little bit of pessimism on my part, and I hope I'm wrong. But there you go. So five billion years of solitude, that's kind of where the title comes from. So. Um, Anyway, let's kind of move on from that. That's really an overview of the book and a uh, really broad overview of the book. You know, talks about a lot of different people at the forefront of this field in different areas. But let's, let's move on to what I'm really here to talk about, which is about this revolution that's unfolding right now for us. The fact that right now, every single person on this planet is really occupying a profoundly important and special moment in history. We're, you know, we're finally, finally able, after four and a half billion years of this biosphere developing on this planet, able to go out and look around all these stars and the planets are pouring out of the sky. We've already found more than 1,000 exoplanets. So that officially, be, I think officially, semi-officially, depending on what you define as a planet, crossed out earlier this month, that threshold of 1,000. Those are confirmed exoplanets. So there's way more out there than we have in our own solar system, obviously. Uh, a single NASA mission, Kepler, which we'll talk a lot more about in a bit, uh, has found more than 3,500 planetary candidates. About 90% of those are probably going to be legit. So there's, you know, they're everywhere. You can run the statistics and basically any time you're looking up at the sky and you see a star, the chances are you're looking at a planetary system. That star probably has planets. And this is kind of new, you know, and it's really exciting. It's a really exciting time to be alive. So that's kind of the big picture. That's where we're going to go. Let's, let's go a little deeper. Let's talk about what we found so far. So how did this begin? Where did this come from? How long has this been happening? Well, you can see this is actually a plot taken from uh, the ex excellent uh, exoplanet catalog run by a French astronomer named Jean Schneider. Uh, we've got the uh, planetary mass. Uh, this is tracking all the, I think it's uh, uh, 1,039 planets, officially, exoplanets. And it's tracking mass on the, uh, the y-axis and the year of discovery on the x-axis. And you can just see here, this, this little dot, um, let me get my laser pointer. Is it going to work? Yeah, this little dot right here, that was actually discovered, as you can see, in 1989. It's a kind of something that's bigger than Jupiter. It might be a brown dwarf. We only went back and realized what that was. The first one that really, really got things started is right here. And that's 51 Pegasi b. That's a hot Jupiter that was discovered around the star, 51 Pegasi, a sun-like star, uh, uh, in 19, uh, 1995. And you can just kind of see, you know, again, if you look at planetary mass here, so right here, that's Jupiter. That's Jupiter mass. So here's 51 Pegasi. And you can just see, you know, there's kind of oh, a couple here each year by year, a little here, some droughts where you don't even have any, and then this happens. And you can see that progressively, these individual dots, each one of these dots being a planet, they're, they're just blurring into lines because we're finding so many of these things. And they're also getting way lower in mass. Right down here, that's below Earth mass. Earth mass is right around here. So, you know, this, it's this huge revolution where we're just getting better and better at finding smaller and smaller things and more and more Earth-like orbits. You know, they're no longer just these big balls of gas hugging their stars like the first planets were. They're smaller planets, potentially rocky planets, planets that could be quite like Earth in nice orbits. Um, so, you know, a lot of this in particular, I mean, this, is, this has been going on for 20 years, obviously. There's no sign it's going to stop. It keeps going. But uh, a lot of this right down here, you know, when you really see these, just, these lines, these walls of worlds right here, that's from Kepler. Kepler is really special. Let's talk about Kepler a little more. So this is a, a view of Kepler's view. Uh, you know, this was launched in 2009. Uh, it's a NASA, uh, NASA spacecraft. I think it was about $600 million. Uh, and it's looking at this little tiny swath of stars that uh, extends out to about 3,000 light years away. And uh, we'll talk about exactly how it's looking for planets in just a little bit. But the important thing to remember, again, is just kind of we're only looking at a little tiny bit here. It was on a three and a half year mission, wildly successful, looking at about 150,000 stars or so. Uh, and again, it's looking mostly for planets that are really about the size of Earth in year long orbits around sun like stars. The reason why it needed at least three years is because, well, maybe we should get into that a little later. But, you know, it, it has to look for the, uh, the planet kind of going around the star, not once, not twice, but three times. So, you know, for a year. 
And uh, yeah, it's just been phenomenal. It's found, as I mentioned, other um, more than 3,500 candidates already. Um, of course, you may have heard uh, in May of this year, it kind of suffered a, suffered a crippling malfunction. It's not doing too well now. It's a lot of its uh, reaction wheels aren't working, so it can't really point very well. It's not totally dead yet, uh, but its glory days are over. The, the Kepler wave, I think, has kind of passed. There's going to be a lot of data analysis to still do in the future, but uh, its, its glory days are, are gone. So what has it told us so far? This is brand new, hot off the presses. This is uh, from last week, a big Kepler meeting last week. This is showing you uh, essentially the breakdown of that, you know, that 3,500 odd candidates that, that they found. Uh, you can see, you know, there's a good number of uh, kind of super Jupiters. There's a hefty number of Jupiter-sized planets. And then you just see this explosion in Neptune-sized planets, so-called super Earth-sized planets, and then Earth's or Earth-sized planets. Now, the, what's interesting about this is that the, uh, the super Earths, that green bar, as well as the Neptune-sized planets, uh, that yellow bar, that orange bar, we really don't have analogs at all for these in our own solar system. These were not expected. They were not predicted. They're on relatively short period orbits, most of them around stars that are smaller and dimmer than our sun. Uh, some of them potentially could be habitable, habitable could potentially be you know, relatively Earth-like, rocky, thin atmospheres. Um, but it's hard to tell because you know, we don't know a lot about them. And again, we have nothing in our solar system to study, really, that, you know, that we can use as a local analog. There's nothing that's to Earth radii, you know, that, that's a pro that there's nothing like that in our solar system. There's, there's no Neptune that's parked interior of Mercury's orbit in our solar system, but we're finding that all over the place when we look with Kepler. And part of that is selection bias, but it is telling us that our understanding of planet formation is incomplete. Um, but, you know, you can look at this. You can look at these 3,500 candidates or so. You can see, okay, 674 Earth-sized planets, one, over 1,000 super Earth-sized planets. Most of those, you know, are candidates, but they're going to be proved legit eventually. Um, you might think that, you know, maybe we've already found kind of this, this 2.0, Earth 2.0, right? Maybe it's lurking in there someplace. Maybe. I will, I will go ahead and make a prediction and say that by the end of the decade, finding a potentially habitable Earth-sized planet around a sun-like star will no longer be newsworthy at all because it's going to happen so much that no one's really going to care. It's not going to be news. So something to think about. But let's see what we really know about, you know, some of these promising worlds. Um, this is a list, I think it's relatively up to date, of the current potentially habitable exoplanets um, according to various metrics. When we say potentially habitable, we're again thinking about, you know, we're thinking blinkered, thinking about what Earth is like. We think it needs to be rocky. We think that it needs to have a relatively thin atmosphere. It's a big plus if it has liquid water. That's obviously the basis for life here. So uh, it needs to probably be in what's called the habitable zone, right? This circumstellar Goldilocks just right region where it's neither too hot nor too cold for liquid water to exist on a planet's surface. So what you're looking at here, this rank list of 12 worlds, is essentially, I mean, all of these have been claimed one time or another as, you know, Earth 2.0s. They've all made headlines as that. And you can see, you know, maybe we have found Earth 2.0. I mean, look, look at this. Well, you got, you got like some, some clouds, you got some seas there, some continents. Well, lighting's a little funny because it's around really tiny stars, but man, those look pretty good, right? Look like Earth. Let's go, let's go pack up the starship, let's go. Well, what do we really know? What do we really know about these places? I've got multiple clickers here. I've got to keep them straight. All right, so actually, pay attention to this third one right here, Gliese 581G, number three. So what you're seeing right here is the actual data. This is what we're getting from the star. This is all we know about that planet, about this system. That's it, and I'll explain it a little bit. The way that we're getting this planet's signature is we're essentially, it's an indirect measurement, and we're looking at the star itself and the starlight, and we can tell when the star is kind of wobbling back and forth in our point of view. Uh, you know, red shift and blue shift. The, 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 the light will get a little redder when it's coming towards us, I'm sorry, going away from us, and a little bluer when it's coming towards us. So if you plot that over time, you plot that motion over time, you get this nice little uh, sine wave. You get this nice little signal of a, an orbiting planet that's tugging on star and making the star wobble. And as you can see, you know, you, you get its year, you get its orbital period by kind of the repetition of this, the, the peak and the trough. Uh, the, uh, the actual strength of the signal, the, uh, how much it's pulling on the star, gives you an estimate of its mass. So you can get its mass, you can get its, you know, some orbital characteristics about it. And uh, you can see here, if you look at these, uh, these little sidebars right here, this is uh, in meters per second. So you can see this, this signal is on the order of, you know, it's like 10 meters per second. Nice and clean, great. That's not Gliese 581g. That's not the planet that may be like Earth. The planet that may be like Earth that everyone was trumpeting a couple of years back is this. 
Look at that. Doesn't look so hot, does it? Not, not a lot of people are convinced this planet exists. I don't know whether or not it exists. I, you, know, you need to get more data. But this is, and, and look at all those dots. This is hundreds of measurements using state of the art, best things we got, the best kit we have. And that's the best we can do right now. So it's, you know, it's, it's look at this measurement here. I mean, it's, uh, it's on the order of like a meter per second. Now, you know, you think about a meter per second, that's kind of like how fast I'm walking right now. And we're doing this for an entire star that's, you know, light years away, this big glowing plasmatic ball of gas. It's, it's remarkable that we can do it at all. But, you know, lots of things can kind of occlude the signal. Star spots, uh, big waves of plasma, stellar cycles. So the point is, is that, you know, we have to be really careful about the claims we make about these planets, these so-called Earth-like planets, because this is a case of one, again, you know, front page news. I don't know if, you, I mean, I keep track of this better than most people, but it was front page news, it was all over the place, and it might not even be real. So, and even if it is real, you know, you're not getting anything about the atmosphere, nothing about the surface, nothing about the climate, nothing that's gonna let you actually anoint it as Earth-like. So, you know, let's talk about Kepler some more, because this is obviously not Kepler data. We're all about Kepler. Well, this is uh, actually kind of one of the Kepler prize, uh, prize finds, the crown jewels. This was announced earlier this year in April. What you're looking at is uh, a planet called uh, Super Earth, called Kepler 62F. It's about 40% larger than Earth. And uh, you may notice this little, that little dot right there, that bright looking star thing. That's not a star, that's actually another planet called Kepler 62E. These things hug uh, the opposite cusps of the habitable zone around this star, which is slightly smaller and dimmer than our sun. So this is a, a case where we're finding two potentially habitable planets in one system. You know, great news, right? I mean, uh, Kepler-62f, the main one you're seeing here, uh, ranks 10th in that, uh, it's number 10 right there. You can see it, little, little, uh, little orb, featureless orb. Kepler-62e, you may notice, its companion, that's that little star, is number one. So that's supposedly, you know, prime real estate right now. That's supposedly where we should pack our starships and go. Um, but again, you know, what do we really know about these planets? So I'll show you again. It's not a lot, not as much as you'd think. Uh, this is the data we have for these planets. You know, maybe hold, pump the brakes. Don't get in your starship quite yet. This is uh, Kepler-62e. That's Kepler-62f. What you're looking at here is what's called a light curve. This is how Kepler finds planets. It doesn't look for wobbles. It doesn't look for the wobbling star. Instead, it looks for these really rare geometric alignments where the star crosses the face, or I'm sorry, the planet, sorry, the planet crosses the face of the star um, as seen from Earth or as seen from Kepler, and it casts a little shadow that we can detect. And for things this small, you know, for things about Earth size, it's pretty tough. The, the Earth uh, imparts a shadow on the sun from interstellar distances that uh, uh, is really minute. I mean, there's no windows in here, unfortunately, but if you think about a typical window pane and the light passing through, a window pane is actually going to dim the light more than an Earth across the sun. So it's a really faint measurement, but we can, we can measure it, and it's remarkable that we can. But you can just see it's, you know, it's, it's not a lot to go on. We have th this little you know, a kind of a paucity of data here, and we have these light curves. And uh, ideally, what you want to do to kind of weed out so-called false positives, because again, these light curves could be caused by star spots or uh, eclipsing binary stars. You know, you have a pair of stars. It could be caused by all kinds of things that aren't planets. Uh, you want to actually get that wobble. You want to get that wobble measurement to confirm uh, you know, each one, of these light, each one of these dips in starlight is actually a planet. But that takes a lot of telescope time. It's really tough to do. Um, and consequently, we actually haven't done it for these bottom two worlds, at least. So we're pretty confident they're planets for various other reasons. But uh, again, it's tough to do. We don't really know. Um, you know, there's always, there's always uncertainties. But what's really cool, the reason why I brought this up is because when you get the wobble, when you get that, uh, that measurement of the wobbling star, and you pair it with the, uh, the light curve, the light curve is giving you the estimated size of the planet. The wobble is giving you the estimated mass. So let's put those together. I know you're all good at math, right? Mass, size, you get density. That's amazing. So what we're doing is we're finding these planets, and we can actually determine whether or not they're mostly made of something like water, or rock, or metal, or gas. And that's phenomenal. Um, but it's not really enough. It's really still not telling us what we really want to know. The Earth-like planets, the planets that might be like ours, the planets that might harbor life that we could maybe someday go to, like Von Braun wanted. So you're probably thinking, you know, I didn't come here for this. It's tired. You know, it's after lunch. I'm tired. Like, why is this guy being such a buzzkill? Why is this guy? just going on about all the things we don't know. I'm sorry, I, I apologize, but this is why. 
This is why. This, what you're looking at right here, is Venus, as seen during its transit last, uh, last year, 2012. Um, I think this image is really emblematic of where we are right now in our search for habitable exoplanets. Uh, you know, you can kind of look at it. You can tell that that's a planet. You can, you know, get an estimate of its size. You, maybe you can figure out its mass a little bit. You can get its orbital period. Um, but, you know, there's, there's not a lot to go on there. You really don't know much about it. And what's important about this and what's particularly kind of resonant is that you have to remember that up until the 1950s, for centuries, people thought that Venus was a wonderful place to live because it gets more sunlight, but it's covered with clouds. Those clouds act like a shield. So they essentially reflect more sunlight. So it's really doing pretty well. If you just you know, run the simple math, it should be nice down there and clement. And people for a long time thought you know, there was going to be like car carboniferous jungles and dinosaurs and you know, flying men, things like that, all kinds of crazy stuff. And it wasn't until the 1950s that we actually started getting a better idea. We started looking at microwave radiation coming out of the atmosphere that suggested it was you know, hot enough to melt lead. Uh, we started seeing things like polarization measurements of, uh, of its atmosphere that suggested that it had sulfuric acid rain. You know, and now, of course, we sent probes. We know that it's a terrible place to live. It's the worst place to live in the solar system, pretty much. But we were fooled for a long time for pretty sound reasons, you know? And uh, the whole point is that this is a world right next door that we thought was Earth-like for a long time. We were totally wrong. And we need to keep this in mind when we make claims or believe what's in the headlines about all these other planets that are being found. So I, just, I really want to really drive that home. But you know, this, this, this image is also emblematic for another reason. And uh, it's positive, not negative. This is where we start talking about the really cool stuff that can happen. So look at this right here. You, I don't know if, it's, if you can see it, but there's this little tiny line that's just limbing the planet, this little arc of starlight. What that is is it's actually the sunlight blasting through the upper atmosphere of Venus. And it's, uh, it's, we can actually, if we study it properly, we can determine it tells us a lot about Venus's atmosphere. And we can do this for exoplanets, which is wild. So this is kind of how the process works. I'll simplify it a bunch. What you need to remember is that you know, whenever light interacts with matter, matter kind of imprints its fingerprint on the light. I shouldn't say matter, but you know, not, not dark matter and stuff, but uh, you know, normal stuff like us, things that are made out of elements, chemicals. So uh, it imprints its fingerprints on the light. You can split it up into a spectrum. You can see little peaks and valleys, little absorption lines and emission lines. You can figure out what the stuff's made of. That's how we know what the stars are made of. That's how we know what the, ga the galaxies are made of the same things that we are. So obviously, you know, pretty basic stuff. Um, but yeah, you can actually get this for transiting planets. You can detect that signal. And we've already done it for some big, hot, puffy worlds, you know, again, some of these hot Jupiters that transit. We've already gotten these signals and we've seen things like sodium in their atmospheres or uh, potassium. Uh, if you did this for Venus and you had, you know, a big enough spectrometer or, or a big enough mirror to gather all the light, you'd see that, you know, there's so much CO2 in that upper atmosphere and there's no water vapor at all. That would suggest probably not a good place to live. You know, don't, don't pack your rockets. So um, this is a nice way forward. This is a way we can actually study exoplanets going into the future and you know, get a good sense of maybe what they're like, uh, get you know, more information to pin down our potential targets, our other Earths. Um, and what's really exciting is NASA, to its credit, has actually started work on a follow-up mission to Kepler called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, supposed to launch in 2017. It's going to be getting, um, uh, it's actually not going to be able to do this measurement, but it's going to be able to get targets for this measurement um, because Kepler's stars are mostly too far away. They're thousands of light years away. We can't get enough photons from them to get this kind of measurement from them. But if there's transiting planets, transiting Earth-sized planets that are around nearby stars, you know, in our cosmic neighborhood, well, we could investigate those with the right kind of telescope. So what kind of telescope are we talking about? We're talking about this thing, this behemoth. It's great. It's a workhorse. It is starving NASA of all its money, or NASA, astroph NASA astrophysics, anyway. It's the James Webb Space Telescope. This is a full-size model. Uh, out at Goddard Space Flight Center. You can see how honking huge this thing is. It's got a 6.5 meter uh, mirror, primary mirror. That's all those golden hexagons. That gray stuff you're looking at is a sun shield that's about the size of a tennis court. Uh, this is all going to be cryogenically cooled uh, when it gets into space. It's going to be packed and folded into a rocket and shot beyond the moon. Uh, and then unfold like kind of like a piece of origami out there. And it really needs to work, because if it doesn't, bad, bad, bad things happen, and we've lost at least a generation of astronomy, space science. So uh, it's, a, it's kind of an all-in bet. Uh, but here's kind of the tough part to admit about it, is that James Webb is going to be able to do this so-called transit spectroscopy, 
you know, getting that information for potentially habitable super-Earth planets around a handful of nearby stars. It's mostly going to be looking for water vapor. Um, and there's a lot of debate over just what James Webb can do, of just what Webb can do. And uh, I have to say I'm kind of a pessimist on this. It's supposed to launch in 2018, so we'll find out pretty soon, I hope. But uh, yeah, it was designed to study the first stars and galaxies, not exoplanets. Um, and if you look at kind of what's needed to, to do this measurement, to get that, uh, that little beam of starlight coming around the planet's edge, its silhouette, uh, it's really going to work best for, you know, kind of puffy planets, uh, things that have big extended atmospheres, things that might have runaway greenhouses. It might be much more like Venus than like Earth. So I'm not really uh, very optimistic about us getting the answers we want, or the answers I want, which is, again, finding Earth twins, finding life out there. I don't think Webb's going to do it. I hope I'm wrong. Um, but you know, the other thing you have to think about is that, you know, we're, again, we're talking about transits. So this is the other aspect of why it's not that great. Remember how I mentioned that transits are a product of a really rare geometric alignment? You know, how often you look at out there, how often do you think a planet is going to be aligned just so? so that it crosses the face of its star and casts a shadow towards Earth. It's pretty rare. It doesn't happen very often at all. Uh, so most of the planets that are out there are going to be totally invisible to us. We can't investigate them this way. And that's a problem because you need a big sample size. We still don't really understand how life formed here. We don't understand. You know, there's a lot of questions we don't understand. We don't quite know exactly what we're looking for. You need to have as big a sample as possible. So you know, if James Webb can do this for like you know, 10 or 12 potentially habitable planets, that's great. But what if you find nothing at all? You don't know what that's telling you because your sample size is too small. But let's say it goes for 50 or 100 or 1,000 exoplanets, which it, potentially habitable exoplanets, which it can't do. But if we could get that kind of sample size, well, all of a sudden, you can run statistics. You can kind of know what's going on. You can, you can get a signal out of that, out of that measurement. Uh, so what's that going to take? How are we going to get this sample of you know, 1,000 nearby stars or you know, something like that? Well, this is how we need to do it. Uh, this is an example of what's called direct imaging. This is a picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, it's a, a planet, or what's thought to be a planet, uh, about Jupiter mass orbiting the star Fomalhaut. This thing, uh, now you probably look at it and it doesn't look that impressive, but again, you know, Jupiter mass planet. Also, it looks like it's relatively close, but it's not. This thing's about four times further out than Pluto. This thing's cold and far, far out. Actually, it's kind of a little hot, which is why uh, it's able to be detected this way. Um, and uh, you know, it's, so we're, this is kind of cutting edge stuff right now, um, but we're going to need to do a lot better. We're going to need to get a lot closer into the star, into the so-called habitable zone, image things that are a lot smaller. And to do that, uh, the best way to really compare it is like saying, you know, there's a, there's a firefly orbiting the world's largest and most powerful spotlight, maybe like, you know, less than a meter away, probably 10 centimeters away. And that's happening in LA, and we're here in New York trying to look at it. And you have to blot out all that light from the spotlight just to see that faint firefly. Another way to look at it is it's like, you know, and this is really much more true, it's like an unlit match kind of on the cusp of a detonating hydrogen bomb, you know, a thermonuclear reactor like stars are, right? So it's like that kind of contrast ratio. It's on the order of 10 billion stellar photons for every single one planetary photon we want to get. Now, that sounds really tough. Um, there's a lot of ways we've kind of figured out in the lab to kind of get this, to get that starlight suppressed. But uh, what it really does require, if you just kind of say we can do the starlight suppression, is it requires a big mirror in space, which means it's going to be expensive. Uh, well, how big are we talking about? We're talking about something this big. Uh, so you've got Hubble Space Telescope, revolutionized astronomy, two and a, two and a half meters or so. James Webb, going to revolutionize astronomy too, six and a half meters. These are two notional designs for planet-finding, life-finding telescopes. You, got, uh, you can tell by their acronym, at last, that astronomers have been looking for this for a long time. Uh, eight meters, 16 meters. This eight meter is going to be able to, if, if we ever built it, would be able to uh, you know, get us the spectra, uh, the, the, the atmospheric information and things for uh, uh, you know, hundreds of nearby planets, or rather planets around hundreds of nearby stars. And that 16 meter, that behemoth, we're talking about thousands of nearby stars we can investigate for potentially Earth-like planets. So, you know, I mean, this is really exciting. Uh, why don't we just go out and build that, right? Well, <laughs> um, oh, I should also say that uh, these Atlas designs are just two of kind of a whole suite of telescopes that exist uh, or notionally exist that have been designed to do this. You know, they come in all different flavors. And kind of collectively, NASA has tended to call them TPFs, or Terrestrial Planet Finders. And uh, around the turn of the century, in the 2000s, actually, they were spending to the tune of $50 million per year to try to make these things happen. Um, originally, the, uh, they were going to launch a pair of them. The first one was going to operate in visible light. It was going to launch next year, in 2014. 
Then there was going to be a more sophisticated, a little more expensive infrared version that was going to launch in 2020. Well, I guess you may have guessed, but we haven't been hearing about these telescopes really very much recently. And that's because they were officially deferred indefinitely in 2006. There just wasn't enough money. And that's because, again, these things are really expensive. We're talking on the order of $10 billion. And that's a lot of money for, uh, for NASA. That's not just chump change you can dig out of the couch cushions, unfortunately. Um, maybe there's another way to do this. Maybe NASA isn't the only way. Um, I think it's relevant that you know I'm speaking at one of the biggest, most powerful companies in the world right now who tends to, <laughs> tends to fund all kinds of crazy things. Something to think about. Um, but you know, meanwhile, the whole point is that you know, as we're dithering and debating over whether or not we can do this, and just you know, per for perspective, the amount of money we're talking about again is like you know, a couple of weeks worth of war in the Middle East, you know, um, maybe how much we spend on Halloween candy each year or, uh, or pets, right? So it's not, in the big scheme of things, that much money. And it's a pretty big payoff, I think. Um, but while we're debating and dithering over whether we can do this, the planets are just, they're going to keep piling up. By 2020, it's not going to be a big deal to find these, you know, potentially habitable planets. But the difference is that we aren't going to know what they're actually like. And there's this huge yawning gap. Right now, officially, NASA is thinking about maybe maybe doing this in the 2030s. That just seems like a long time to wait for me. I just, I, maybe I'm just impatient. So this is my final slide. Um, this is kind of the payoff, right? So, okay, we, we make these big investments. We build a telescope or two that can do this. What's it gonna look like? What's it gonna do for us? Well, you may recognize this image. I have doctored it a little bit, obviously, with uh, this blue circle. Earth does not have rings. Uh, that is Earth taken by Voyager 1 from a viewpoint of about 4 billion miles away, past the orbit of Pluto. Uh, this was taken in, I think, 1990, 1990 not 1991. And uh, this kind of approximates what we would see. You know, if we, if we build one of these telescopes and we, get, we find a little promising planet and we image it, this might be what it looks like, a pale blue dot, as Carl Sagan called it. Well, it doesn't seem very impressive until you realize how much we can take out of that pale blue dot, the way we can data mine it. So, just looking at its brightness change, the way that as it rotates, depending on the geometry, if we're lucky, you know, as it rotates and we see the kind of the fluctuation of, of illumination on its surface, if you kind of track that over a long enough period of time via photometry, light curves, you can pin down its uh, rotation rate. You can get the length of its day. If you get that, you can bin it up. You can bin up the data day by day by day by day. You know what's passing under you each time. And you can start to see things like oceans or grasslands or deserts, because these all have different reflectance. Grasslands are kind of medium, uh, you know, mid-scale. You have uh, oceans that are really dark. They absorb a lot of light. You have, uh, except when they kind of have to glint, you know, every now and then, which is an, its own thing that we can use to map. And then you have, you know, deserts that are extremely, or ice, that are extremely reflective. So you can do very, very crude mapping, Google mapping of other planets beyond the solar system. You can do that with just that point of light. Again, it's crude. But you know you can always build a bigger space telescope, right? So uh, the other thing you can do, of course, is get spectra. You can get atmospheric spectra. You can figure out what's in that atmosphere. And you know when we do this for Earth, uh, there's another famous spacecraft from NASA called Galileo that did this for Earth, uh, I believe, in 1991. You can see the kind of the breadth of life, literally, in our atmosphere. You know you can see free oxygen. Oxygen is a very reactive gas. It doesn't want to really hang around in the air. It wants to fall out of the air and rust. It wants to go into rocks. Yet somehow, our atmosphere is 21% oxygen. You can see methane. Methane also does not really want to hang around in the atmosphere, especially when there's oxygen around. You put oxygen and methane into a sealed box at room temperature and pressure, it's going to turn into carbon dioxide and water vapor. Yet somehow, we still have this breath of methane, this wisp of methane in our atmosphere. So you can look at that, put, put it together, and you can kind of think, well, you know, it's kind of out of chemical equilibrium, out of thermodynamic equilibrium profoundly by many, many, many orders of magnitude. And we can't really think of a better explanation for that. Again, we're blinkered. We're looking here on Earth. We don't know all the whole panoply of life that exists out there. Uh, but that's a pretty good signature of life as far as we can understand it. And we've done it for our own planet from the depths of space. So that's kind of the big picture. That's what we're trying to do. That's what I think people should get excited about for the coming generations of, of astronomy. And I guess I'll just close by saying um, this is something that I, I believe in fervently. Obviously, a lot of other people in the book believe in it a lot. And I do think that this is the kind of thing that we could really do quite soon. I think this is the kind of thing that if we really wanted to, we could do in a decade. But um, the way things are going right now, it looks like we're all going to be old and gray or dead by the time it happens. And I hope that we can change that. So with that, I'll go ahead and take your questions. Hey. 
So you talked a lot about upcoming space telescopes. What about upcoming ground telescopes? I know there are quite a few of those being planned. Like, yeah. What can they contribute to this? Great question. They can do a lot. Um, it, you know, it depends on kind of what you're going for. They can do a whole lot in terms of uh, trying to pin down, for instance, uh, a lot of the Kepler candidates. They can maybe measure some of those wobbles. So you can actually get you know, the mass as well as the size and get the density, confirm it's actually a planet instead of a candidate. Uh, more importantly, you know, we're really coming to this dawning era of extremely, extremely large telescopes. These are huge things that are going to have big light collecting surfaces, I think, on the order of you know, like 30 meters. That's really big. Uh, and uh, these things, these kind of big light buckets, uh, are probably going to be coming online by the end of the decade. There's ver various different projects, the Giant Magellan Telescope, the 30-meter telescope. Uh, there's a few others. Uh, and hopefully they're going to come online by the end of the decade. Those could, in theory, do some uh, measurements, uh, get some spectra for uh, really like, kind of super Earth-sized planets that are orbiting red dwarf stars, which are much smaller and dimmer than, than our sun. And if you look at the kind of the contrast ratio, in particular when they're transiting, uh, but if you look at the contrast ratio of that really small dim star, that really big planet transiting across it, that's actually a signal that, especially in the infrared, you know, uh, which you can get from the top of a mountain someplace, you could conceivably get some legit nice uh, atmospheric spectra from. But it's only going to be able to do that. They're only going to be able to do that, as far as I know, for a handful of stars in the sky. So this really gets back to the question of what's your sample size. If you want to investigate hundreds of stars or thousands of stars, which you probably need to do to find some other planet that's like ours, you know, uh, then you have to go to space. Otherwise, you're really depending on luck. Thank you for coming uh, first. Uh, so let's say that we are lucky, and by 2050, uh, hopefully we'll all be alive by then. <laughs> we'll find a very good candidate, with like 95% certainty, 20 light years from Earth. What will, be able to, will we be able to do about that? Well, I think, I mean, in some ways, we're only limited by the laws of physics in our imagination. I think that uh, what we do about it is, I mean, it's kind of up to, I guess, whoever's in charge then. But I mean, you can think about all kinds of grandiose notions of um, building, you know, some kind of small robotic probe, maybe a series of them, maybe about the size of a Coke can, maybe sent voyaging at 10% the speed of light. I think that's probably something we could figure out how to do. Um, Maybe it could return some you know, close-up images. Uh, you could think about things like that. You can think about building an even bigger telescope or even fleets of telescopes. Right now, I've, only been, I've, I've been restricting this conversation, just to simplify it, to uh, filled apertures, bi you know, big pieces of glass, big mirrors in space. One of the most exciting things is to go with unfilled apertures, to use interferometry to actually you know, link together uh, kind of like a hyper telescope. You link together a lot of small individual apertures, maybe dishes that are about you know, a meter in size, but you get a lot of them, and you get a big, big baseline stretched out. And then you get enough of that, you can, you can get some pretty crazy surface feature mapping. You can do things like, I mean, in simulations, you know, and looking at Earth from 10 parsecs, say, you can see things like uh, uh, phytoplankton blooms in the Pacific Ocean. You can see coastlines. You can see, you know, mountains. You can see nighttime electric lighting. You can see New York City. You can see LA. So, there's things that we can think of that we could do that are even more futuristic, or you know, we could try to go there. But you know, for me, it's not so much about what do we do then necessarily. It's just the fact that you know, we're kind of on the cusp of being able to do these things, of being able to find out whether or not we're alone for the first time in the history of the biosphere in four and a half billion years. And uh, I'm actually somewhat more compelled by the notion that we'll look out there and we aren't going to find anything like that. And I think uh, you know, if that happens, then I. I don't know if it'll really change the lives of uh, people, everyday people on the street, but I think for people who think about it, it might kind of change how you look at the world and how you look at your own life. If you realize that, you know, for, let's say, a radius of 500 light years or 300 light years around the Earth, this is literally the coolest thing going, you know? <laughs> I think that's a powerful thing to think about, and I think if we had that realization, um, maybe we'd take a little better care of ourselves and our planet. Sort of along the same lines. Um... I mean, if we're looking for company, it would seem that, that something like SETI would be more interesting than looking for other planets that happen to have oxygen. I mean, it might be that you know, all the cool people out there are nitrogen-based except for us. Who knows? Right. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, and you know, this, is not, um, this is not in any way meant to bash SETI. I think SETI is great. I think uh, it's tragically underfunded. It's been tragically underfunded the entirety of its existence since you know, Frank Drake first pointed a telescope at uh, Epsilon Eridani and Tau SETI. Um, but the, the problem with that is that you know, th I think we have this really kind of 
Uh, you know, there, inverse square law is a real thing. And if you look at our own emanations, people sometimes think that, oh, well, you know, if they're out there, they already know we're here because of our, uh, you know, our I Love Lucy or whatever that's, that's going out there. But I don't think so. I think if you look at the, how big, the at least as far as we understand it, how big the hardware has to be to detect that even just a few light years away, I don't think so. So uh, the point is, is that uh, all this radio communication or you know, communication via laser pulses, whatever it is, it requires intentionality. It requires someone saying, huh, you know, I want to invest billions of dollars, a lot of treasure, a lot of time into beaming this message out into space. And we're listening for those messages. And I'm not saying that's bad to do. I think we should do it. But oxygen in an atmosphere, this kind of, you know, disequilibrium we're talking about, and it doesn't just have to be oxygen. There's other things we can look for. Uh, there's no intentionality required. It's just something that's a product of metabolism. Life exists. And as far as we know, it, life has to maintain its orderly structures. So it vents byproducts. So you know, if you can detect that in an atmosphere, it doesn't really matter whether or not the little green men want to talk to you. You can find them. So that's why that's why I think this is a little maybe more important. Shouldn't say more important, but maybe prioritize that. Then we find the cool stuff. Then we you know do the SETI with big dishes. Uh, hi, um, I saw that India recently launched um, a Mars mission. I guess. Um, are there are other countries or other space programs doing anything interesting? Uh, well, um, you know, a, a guy once told me that the best way to make this stuff happen is actually to convince the Chinese to go out and find, you know, the nearest the nearest uh, 100 potentially habitable planets and name them all, you know, after after departed emperors and things. Um, right now, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of activity internationally. Uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, is doing some things. They have some really exciting missions proposed. There's one called Kiops, Kiops, Kiops. Uh, there's another one called uh, Plato. Um, but these are not uh, kind of Battlestar Galactica scale, really large missions that are going to be able to bring home the bacon, so to speak. Um, uh, the, the European Space Agency was, uh, was on board with NASA for these terrestrial planet finders earlier uh, last decade. But you know, again, kind of NASA decided we should go back to the moon instead and uh, keep doing a few more shuttle flights and uh, did that. So um, right now, it is mostly the US, but the US isn't really doing much. So no one's really doing a lot. It's me again. Hey. So um, I have a, a theory. It's extremely expensive to launch uh, things to space, especially if we want to put them in the Lagrange one point. No, I mean, I mean which no one ever done uh, so far. Uh, so we don't even know if we can do that. Um, Maybe it's it's going to be more efficient to be a little bit more strategic about it and invest in ways to deliver things to space in a cheaper fashion, so yeah. that it will be easier to bring those big telescopes. You're you know you're totally right. I mean the, the main cost, the reason why you know the reason why these things cost so much and they take so long to develop is because they can't fail. James Webb is a great example. You know again it's kind of got the astrophysics program of NASA on the ropes because it's so expensive and so over budget. Um, these things are so expensive because they have to be launched into space, they have to be built um, to not fail in space, they have to be built to survive the launch. And it's just expensive to get out into space fundamentally. You know, our current launch costs, especially if you're doing something like the shuttle, I mean, you know, that was ridiculously expensive. Um, if we can bring launch costs down, you know, via like uh, Elon Musk, right, SpaceX, things like that, um, or if we can find a way to um, maybe build things modularly, right, if you can actually, just like we do uh, on ground-based observatories, you know, no one, no one assembles a whole telescope in a basement someplace and then you know, hikes it up a mountain and puts it up there and expects it to work. Instead, you build it on the mountain and you bring it into alignment and you make it work from there. Um, we could do that in space too. And I think it's actually, uh, there's a guy in the book, uh, the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, Matt Mountain, who's a very big proponent of this idea. He thinks that it's a good mission for NASA and for NASA's astronaut corps to do um, in the interim of uh, you know, going to Mars or whatever. I think it's more exciting than visiting an asteroid personally. If we could build a big planet finding space telescope out there and service it in space, that's awesome. I think we should do that. Um, so these are ideas that everyone's thinking about. And I think you're on the right track, though. We need to get launch costs down. We also need to, frankly, I think, get, uh, get space science you know, solely out of the hands of, uh, of big federal agencies, probably. Any more? I think it was Neil deGrasse Tyson who said that if you just convince the Chinese to launch a massive space program, the U.S. will be on Mars in a decade. <laughs> um, but uh, you mentioned earlier that it's kind of tough to get people excited about this kind of exploration because it's so commonplace, I think. Um, 
But one thing, and someone mentioned SETI earlier, one, th one cool thing they did maybe like six or seven years ago was they had this program run out of their institute in Berkeley, I think, where they leveraged the power of the web to get a lot of this heavy processing and um, just where they were lacking the computer power. They just yeah. set up this proxy service where people at home could volunteer their computers to help process this massive uh, corpus of data that they were taking in from all their satellites. I'm a SETI at home volunteer. Anyone? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, um, do you think there's, we'll ever get to the point where if web is giving us so much more information than we can possibly sift through in any reasonable time that we could leverage the power of the web to help quicken the search, I guess? That's a great question. And the great part of the answer is that we're already doing it. There's a great program called Planet Hunters. Um, that's, I, th I mean, I think it's affiliated mostly. It's, it's a lot of funding. Fun funding for it comes through uh, the Planetary Society, um, which I recommend everyone support. Um, and uh, this is something that actually looks at light curves from Kepler. And a lot of times, you know, I mean, we talk about planets pouring out of the sky. I mean, Kepler is like a fire hose that we're all trying to drink from. There's so much data that's coming out of it. I mean, it, the, the t you know the telescope's kind of out of commission right now. It had this pointing error, so it's not even delivering a lot of new data. We're still processing through, churning through all that data from like last year. So we don't, we haven't even processed it all. And Planet Hunters is this great project where, you know, yeah, you, you go through and everything's automated is what I'm saying for, for Kepler. So much of it is just algorithmic where it's like, you know, you flag something, okay, maybe this is of interest, you know, it goes in this bin, oh, it's not, it goes in this bin. Well, you know, algorithms are imperfect and uh, they don't always catch things that human eyes do. And uh, so Planet Hunters volunteers go through and they look through the light curves tag things that look promising. And actually, they recently discovered uh, a seven-planet system. It's the, I think maybe the second seven-planet system, maybe even the first that Kepler has found. And that was through volunteer effort. And I think there's a huge potential for that. But I just want to say, you know, the other half of that is that I think we can't get too kind of lost in the woods of thinking about like Kickstarter like stuff. Because, you know, volunteer work is great. And, and, and that kind of activity is great where you're sifting through data and stuff. I'm a little more. Um, uh, not so wild about like the notion that we're all going to Kickstarter fund like a big space telescope to find other Earths, <laughs> just because like I mean how often do like you know does a five billion dollar Kickstarter program happen? And the other question is like you know it's kind of an abdication of you know what we I mean the biggest Kickstarter thing, the biggest crowdfunding thing we have is our taxpayer, you know our, our what we pay in taxes, right? I mean NASA in a way is crowdfunded, it's funded by us. So I think that if you if you're just you know either resorting to the beneficence of billionaires to do this or you know the crowd well you're really missing the fact that like you know what is nasa doing and then you have to question what is nasa's purpose right so i think that uh before we get on the bandwagon of like that kind of thing we have to really consider what we already have on the table cool thanks well it's been a lot of fun guys is there any more questions we can always talk afterwards you know i know that everyone's probably got other things they got to do so <laughs> thanks <laughs> <laughs>